Under Nui's 12-year tenure, PepsiCo's revenue saw a growth of more than 80%. Did bold things, did transformational things. She's created a new billion-dollar brand every other year. With 41 women CEOs. She transformed that company. Did things that people at that time uh, criticized me for, but now call it prescient. This idea that she, she fundamentally moved not just Pepsi, but arguably the whole industry. She was the first woman to be the CEO of PepsiCo. She was the first woman of color to be a CEO. Inherited a company that was very out of step with what younger people but She's want. always thought bigger than just PepsiCo. I travel out to New York to hear the story of one of the most incredible CEOs of our time. A woman who defied all odds, Indra Nui. Today's documentary was powered by Huel, a quick, affordable, and nutritionally complete source of food. Find out more with the link below. I've had many failures, okay, and if I uh, said that I didn't have failures, I'd be lying. But failures make you stronger if you choose to learn from them. You can go to school on why you failed, not just why you failed. When somebody else failed, why did they fail? Go to school, put the steps down of what they did, which step was done wrong, where did they miss something. Use it as a teachable moment. Don't just say, oh my God, I failed and grieve and then go on to the next failure. Because if you don't learn from this failure, you'll commit the same mistake again. You've got to grieve. I mean, grieving is human. You've got to grieve. If I told you, oh, just brush it off, then you really don't care. I want you to care. Care enough to learn from what went wrong and then make sure it doesn't happen again. So you've got to have that courage to go back and learn from things, as opposed to who should I blame? That's a terrible, terrible thing to do. Don't ask who should I blame. Just ask yourself what went wrong. Different mindset. So I'm not a poster child for routines. So don't use my morning routine or night routine or whatever. Uh, it's an unusual one. I don't sleep much. I'm one of those genetic people who would struggle to sleep. So the advantages I could get by on four or five hours of sleep. So it gave me 19 to 20 hours to read, work, do other things. Second, I speed read. So I can go through documents, huge documents fast and retain them and somehow connect them in my head. So this combination of speed reading, connecting dots and not sleeping enough gave me these wonderful, uh, valuable hours to be able to do a lot more than anybody else could do. So, you know, I'd usually be up by four or five, have my cup of coffee and plow through a lot of reading material, get to work by eight, drop my kids off in school, go to work. I'd be at work till about six, come back home, dinner with the kids, help with homework, start reading again, go to bed around midnight. That was a routine I kept right through my working life. In retrospect, sounds awfully tiring. But I gave up everything that was personal, meaning going to ball games or going to shows. I gave up all that. I just worked. Worked, the, you know, worried about the kids, the family. Just worked. That's it. Just those priorities, family, kids, work. You know, I didn't choose to come into this world. Somebody put me into this world. And I think we're all in this world for such a short time. How many ever years you live is still short versus overall, um, you know, uh, humanity. I think that you've got to think about contributing the most in the time that you're on the earth. My name is Indra Nui. I was born in India. And in those days, where I grew up, especially in the south of India and in Madras, uh, women didn't work, women didn't go to college. And came to the United States in 1978. They came to the airport, saw me off. Daughter of theirs was going 8,000 miles across the oceans, and they won't see me for a while. It was a brave act on their part to send me across the oceans. And the rest is history. I was born into a very, very progressive family uh, where my father and grandfather basically said, the girls in the family are going to be treated exactly like the boys are being treated. So we're going to let you guys study as much as you want, as long as you get good grades. 
We're going to let you do whatever you want. Fly, soar, dream. We're not going to hold you back because of your gender. So in many ways, in a conservative India that was just beginning to discover itself, our family broke all the rules. So in a way, I won the lottery of life. So while I was being asked to dream and soar on the one hand, my mother, who was a product of that culture, very brilliant woman, who would have been CEO had she been allowed to study, had to live within the norms of society. So she had that pressure from society to find a husband for us and get us married off. So it felt like there was one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator at all times. But I think deep down inside, she wanted to be a CEO to whatever that meant. She wanted to do something meaningful. And she lived her life vicariously through my sister and myself. So this combination of the brake and accelerator allowed us to thrive, allowed us to do whatever we wanted to do. And the two of us, my sister and I went off and got uh, you know, high school diploma, a college degree, a master's degree, and began to work. So it was a wonderful upbringing in a tight family that was bound by all of the uh, history and the culture of you know, Hindu India. At the same time, progressive parents who said, go on, give it a try. My sister and I were perhaps a handful of you know, 20 people from India, 20 women in India who were admitted to the business schools in India. My sister went to a very prestigious business school on the West Coast, and I went to the other prestigious school on the East Coast. India only had about four business schools at that time. You write a very competitive exam and you get in. Once my sister got in, I had to do the same because I was competitive with her. So I managed to get into the school in Calcutta. And once you graduate from those schools, you get grabbed by companies because uh, there were so few business graduates. And in any class, only five women graduated, 100 guys and five women. I was one of the five women in my class and um, I went to work for Metro Beardsall, which is really a British uh, textile company, Tootles, of Manchester. And um, I worked in that company for a while, loved the job, until there was a South Indian mill strike that shut down the business. There was nothing to sell because the, all the mills were on strike. But at that time, a lot of my friends from college and people I knew in the city of Madras had left India to come to the United States. At that time, the U.S. was the beacon of hope and dreams and aspirations and innovation and entrepreneurship. And there was a mass brain drain of the best talent in the U.S. And they kept writing to me saying, you've got to come here, this place is so like you. You love music, you love sports, you love creation. You know, we're all having a ball, you should come. So I said, look, let me see first whether my parents will allow me to go. Second, whether I'll get admitted to a college or a graduate program. And three, if I'll get any aid. Because remember, we can't afford to pay for a college education in uh, the U.S. So I was sort of uh, in the U.S. library, uh, U.S. consulate library, flipping through magazines. And I found an article about this new school that had opened up at Yale called the Yale School of Management, which linked the public and private sector. So I decided to apply to that on a whim. I just said, let me just apply and see what happens. They waived my application fee because I couldn't afford that either because remember, I haven't told my parents about it. So I applied and didn't think I'd get in. Then this letter shows up in the mail saying I got in. So I went to my parents and said, hey, I got into the Yale School of Management. And they said, good, put that letter away and go back and do what you're doing because we can't afford to send you. Okay, two weeks later, I get another letter. We're going to give you a third of the money in scholarships, a third of the money in sort of a work-study program, and another third is a loan. And uh, we'd like you to come to Yale. So now, like, I can do this myself. I don't need money. All that I need is an air ticket, which I had enough savings I could pay for it. And um, I can go, but my parents aren't going to let me go. So I go and broach the subject to my father and my mother. My grandfather had passed away. I said, I've gotten in with aid. I don't need money from you. I have savings for an air ticket. Um, can I go? 
And then started this huge discussion at home, should we or should we not? And I think my father won out. He said, if this had been our son, we would have let him go. So why should we hold her back? She's not married, how can I let her go, says my mother. Then let's find her a guy and get her married. And I say, no, not, not a chance in hell. I don't want to get married now. So they allowed me to go to the US, which I was surprised by, Jordan, I'll be very honest with you. It took a lot of courage on the part of my mother, in particular, to say go. came to Yale and the rest is history. It's the first time I'd left India. So to me, everything was alien. And in those days, they didn't have a well-developed structure to support international students. This was 1978. So there isn't a structure to support international students. And this was also the days of no wheels on suitcases. Can you believe there was actually a time when we suitcases didn't have wheels? So I show up at Yale with these two giant suitcases filled with stuff, completely irrelevant for the US. I don't even know why I packed what I did. And they process me and they say, walk those six blocks to your dorm. And I have these two heavy suitcases and I'm not going to spend a penny on a cab because I have so little money to live on. So I carry these two suitcases six inches at a time. And after a few hours, I reach the dorm and I settle in and desperate loneliness stepped, stepped in because there were, nobody else had come into the dorm. I was all alone. I didn't know what to buy in the grocery store because I never shopped in a grocery store, which was a self-help grocery store. So it was all alien to me. Um, I was a vegetarian. There was hardly anything to eat for a vegetarian. Now, vegetarianism is very common now, but in those days, everything was meat. I never had cheese or pizza before, so there were pizza places galore, but I didn't know what it was. And so I was completely lost those early days, completely lost, until some international students actually stepped in and taught me how to shop in a grocery store, how to open a bank account, because those days you have to go to the bank, open a bank account, and get a mailbox, because there were no emails those days. They taught me all the basics of life in the United States. and. Uh, they taught me how to eat pizza, and I couldn't take it because you need a quiet, pizza is an acquired taste, and I didn't have that taste, so I gagged. And they just told me, look, if you don't eat pizza, you're dead as a vegetarian because pizza is the most common thing in New Haven, so you, start, you better start getting used to it. So they taught me how to douse the pizza in red chili flakes uh, and eat it. So the, you know, the red chili flake and the, uh, how hot it is overpowers the taste of uh, cheese. Today I can't live without pizza. We've come a long way, baby. But, uh, you know, I, I had to learn everything from scratch. Minimum wage, I think, was 235 those days. Don't look at it as 235. It was worth a lot, 235. Uh, and so I was happy to have a job which paid almost $3. Uh, I'd play bridge Saturday night, all night. It was great. Lived in a dump of a dorm at Yale. Not the greatest building at all, but you know, it was all the poor international students who lived in that dorm. So we built a great community. And Yale School of Management was just an uplifting experience. I loved it. I graduated from Yale School of Management in 1980. And I became CEO in 2006. Where does your work ethic come from? Does that come from, from India or from your, your parents? Oh, my parents and my grandparents who were relentless. I just said, if you promise to do something, do it perfectly or don't do it at all. Nobody knew what a CEO was those days because in my family, nobody was in business. They were bank officials, lawyers, doctors. That's about it. Engineers, a few of them. So. The word working in business, CEO, never entered anybody's uh, vernacular. You know, my belief was always, I can do the job I'm doing. That's all I did. I was very, very focused on doing the job I was given very, very well, better than anybody else. Um, you know, I honestly believe, Jordan, that if you have a long-term plan and you're working towards it, if any uh, move does not, you know, uh, deliver exactly on plan, you get disappointed. And my point of view was focus on what you're doing very well. Don't have a long-term plan and let events take their course. 
And if you ask, if you'd asked me in 2002, are you going to become CEO of PepsiCo, I'd have said, I have no clue and I don't care. So the real issue is, I would say this more generally, everybody, just focus on what you're doing. Dream, but focus on what you're doing. Don't let the dreams sort of cloud what you have to do today. I joined PepsiCo in 94 as head of strategy. In, two, in 99, I was made the CFO of the company, which surprised me because I didn't look for that job. And I was just told one day, you're the CFO. Go ahead, take on the job, okay? Uh, in 2000, I was made president and CFO. So they added a whole bunch of stuff to me, made me a member of the board of directors. And again, I earned my way there. I didn't inherit that job, nothing. I mean, I just had to prove that I was capable of doing all this. And um, in 2006, I was truly surprised when I was told I was going to be CEO. For two reasons. One, I didn't think my boss was going to retire when he did. And second, you know, they had a lot of people to pick from. PepsiCo is a talent academy. They had a lot of people to pick from, and they picked me. So any job I did, I put the company before me. I worked really hard to do my job well, but I took whatever assignment I was given and really understood how it connected with the rest of the company. So my bosses always felt that they could trust me to get the job done way better than anybody else. So that helped. In your job, you have to ask yourself, what is my proposition that I'm offering this company? They've got to be able to say, God, we cannot uh, you know, be good in this area if Jordan is not involved in it. Or, we're having this meeting. I know Jordan is not responsible for this area, but bring him into the meeting because he has a unique point of view. And people have to know what that unique proposition is to, that you bring to the company. In my case, it was an ability to think tangentially, bring points of view, connect dots that didn't feel obviously connected, but I would find a way to connect them and make new and interesting shapes for the company. But the best example was this German guy I used to work for at Motorola, Gerhard Schulmeier went on to ABB. And when he first went on to ABB, I didn't join him. And he kept calling me and saying, I need somebody like you to work for me. I said, he said, could you find somebody? I said, use a headhunter and get somebody. So he called a headhunter and said, I need an Indra Nui. So the headhunter called me and said, what is an Indra Nui? I said, I don't know. I mean, that's me, but I don't know what it is. So we tried to write a job description for what I was doing for Gerhard. And I realized that the Bottom line was, I was making his life easier. I would take things off his plate. I would make it easy for him to go into a meeting fully prepared, even though he'd never looked at the material, because I would give him briefing papers that made his life easier. So he could work on other parts of the company that I was not involved in. And so, again, I put him and the company before me. I focused on how to make my CEO successful. Okay, and so I think, to him, that was a proposition. Here is a person who works to make life better for the people around her so that the company can do better. Okay, and so you have to have a proposition that's crystal clear and everybody invites you in because of that proposition. And sometimes you may have to go outside the boundaries of your job to help others, to improve things for the company. Find a way to do it. Find a way to do it. Don't say, I don't want to get involved because it takes too much of my time or the other person may be pissed off. Give people a helping hand. If you believe they will look better, if you can give them some input to do something better. And that's all I did through my entire life. That's how I made a name for myself. Was it a time commitment? Yes. Was it time away from the family? Yes. But I didn't know any other way to do the job. And that's what I think got me noticed. And people said, she's a keeper. And very often I'd get invited into meetings that I didn't belong in. Or I'd be walking across the corridor, there'd be a meeting going on. People say, Indra, join this meeting. Just, just put your head in. I'm saying before I was CEO, they just say, just come on in, come and listen to this conversation. I'm like, it's nothing to do with me. Just come in and listen. And you know, I'd, I wouldn't say anything at the meeting, but later on I would tell them, did you think about this or this or this? Oh, shit, we didn't think about this. So that's what I mean by saying, if you're going to add value, people want you to be on their team. I actually think learning begins after you graduate from college. Because all that you've done is build the foundation. Nobody sees the foundation, they only see the house above the foundation, right? So we don't build the bricks to build the rest of the house and complete it. 
and that takes a lot of work. Look at failures. What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? What did they do wrong? What could have been done better? Don't bask in sort of uh, uh, glee because somebody failed. Tell yourself, God, for the company, it's not good that this person failed. How do we make sure it doesn't happen for the company again? Dear mom, I really love you. I really would appreciate if you came home early. Please, 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 please. If you say yes, I love you again. You kept these things these all these years, why? I don't know, I cannot get myself to not look at them regularly. You still look at them? I look at them. When you have two children, your responsibilities grow exponentially. And with two girls at home, you know, um, when you're married, you've got a husband also to worry about. And usually husbands get relegated to the bottom of the list because you're so busy doing other things. And the jobs you're doing, it's not just one job, it's multiple, uh, it, the equivalent of multiple jobs every time you move up a pyramid. Without that family help, I couldn't have done it. I picked the right spouse, he helped, and uh, the family helped. And without that infrastructure, I couldn't have done what I did. So again, I won the lottery of life there, that I had a family that was willing to step in, and they were proud of what I did. They never once said, quit your job and stay home. It's your responsibility. They said, what can we do to help you? My goal is, uh, at every point in time, what can I give back? How do you want to be remembered? Nobody remembers you for the money you made. They'll remember you for what a difference you made to society or communities or whatever. So that's all I care about right now. Today's documentary was fueled by Huel. Huel is our sponsor and the reason they're our sponsor is because I have personally used them for the past two years. Whether we're flying to LA or New York or going down to London to make these documentaries and film the podcast episodes, you won't find me without a bottle of fuel. When you're a busy person, whether you're in corporate or you're an entrepreneur or an athlete or a filmmaker, sometimes you get caught off guard and you can't find a nutritionally complete source of food with all the nutrients you need, all the protein that you need, and it's quick and affordable in a moment. It's very difficult. Huel comes in clutch. This is where Huel is absolutely amazing and it's absolutely changed the way in which we make these documentaries. So if you want to find out more for yourself, head to the link down below where you can find out more about the Huel range and the different products they have, including my favorite Huel Black Edition, which is a high protein content version and I have found fantastic for my performance in the gym. Have a blessed and productive day and I'll see you in the next one. Did I mention they taste great too? Link down below.